Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Righteous Indignation. Its continuing mission, to conquer strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, and to boldly murder them like nobody has done before. Greetings, Wraith ships, and welcome to Codex Compliant. Let us boldly go back to the distant time of 1991 and set off at warp 9.75. Okay, this is way too many Star Trek references, isn't it? Games Workshop have never been shy of having another shot at a concept they've previously attempted. Before Dreadfleet, there was Man of War. Before Adeptus Titanicus, there was Adeptus Titanicus. And before Battlefleet Gothic, there was Space Fleet. No relation to that episode of Black Mirror. Space Fleet was a boxed game put out by Games Workshop in 1991, and was a game of spaceship combat in the Warhammer 40,000 universe for two to four players. So come with us on this merry adventure and discover the game system that Games Workshop forgot. Or at the very least, just stop making content for and so everyone just kind of moved on. Before we go any further, we'd like to shout out leadplague.blogspot.com. Their posts on Spacefleet were invaluable in creating this video, and also a big, big thank you to Shanus for sending the actual game to us, which was moderately important to have when making a video about it. Thanks, man. So much like the Citadel combat cards we covered a few videos ago, Space Fleet was, by their own admission, intended as a way of getting the uninitiated into Games Workshop's games without having to deal with the complexity, and presumably expense, of their mainline systems. So its age range was a bit lower than you might expect, from 8 to adult. Essentially it was a way of getting the kids hooked while they were young, so they'd grow into adults that made bad financial decisions. If I eat nothing but rice for the next two months, I can totally afford to buy this model. Despite coming out in 1991, we got our first view of Space Fleet in 1989 when White Dwarf printed an article talking about an upcoming space combat game, showing off the box art as well as concept art by Jess Goodwin of 40k Ships and their crew. Although this game was not actually Space Fleet, it was Battlefleet Gothic. No, not that one. This version of the game was designed by Richard Halliwell and was apparently not super great and was incredibly complicated. We've heard it said that protractors were involved and few fun things in life involve protractors. This game was ultimately shelved, but since the models and art had already been created for it, Andy Jones and Jervis Johnson created a much simpler game to get use out of those assets, and so Space Fleet was born. To those of you who are curious, the 1999 Battlefleet Gothic game had very little to do with the old rules Halliwell wrote a decade previous, but BFG's creator, Andy Chambers, chose to revive the name to acknowledge the previous work, and because it's just a really cool name, which I mean, is fair, it, it is a really cool name. Also, if you're wondering if GW has ever done this before, as in advertised a game that wouldn't come out for many years and when it did it was radically different, well here's an advert from 1983 for Rogue Trader. Weirdly, Dr. Gasalo's amazing intergalactiac psycho circus is just about the only thing from this advert that did end up in 1987's Rogue Trader, for reasons that perplex and terrify scholars to this day. So what did you actually get in the box? There were six game tiles, the boards for this board game, a host of tokens, helm computers and combat displays for each player, a space fleet sign of no discernible purpose, four six-sided dice, two sprues which would traditionally contain four spaceships but rebels that we are, ours are in this bag, four stands for said spaceships, and the rules which are generally considered a fairly important part of this kind of product. Oh, and there's also a little flyer for four GW standalone games, Crunch, Ultramarines, Mighty Warriors, and Space Fleet itself. The bottom part of the box is exclusively dedicated to reminding you that these four games exist, in fact. Which is probably why, to this day, everyone won't stop talking about the hit game Crunch. I just like saying the word Crunch. The top part of the box is also notable since it's an essential, seriously, you can't play Space Fleet without it part of the game. Not just as a place to roll your dice in, but also having some of the rules printed inside it. Speaking of the box, the box art is originally by Terry Oakes, but is actually made from two bits of artwork. The ships viewed through the window were replaced for the final release with some artwork by Ralph Moore. You can see the original version on the 1989 Battlefleet Gothic preview, and also on this signed print of the original artwork, a thing that we own because of course we do. Reportedly this alteration was due to the ship designs changing slightly after the original work was commissioned. 
Space Fleet itself is pretty simple to play. You set out the board and each player gets a ship, a helm computer, and a combat display. Oh, and one of the sectors here is Necromunda. Thought you'd all get a kick out of that. Each player then places 12 shield tokens on their combat display, representing the ship's shield strength in different areas, sharing them between its four facings, however they want, and place four damage tokens in the center. The damage tokens are your ship's health. Each player then picks a corner to start in and the game can begin. The turns are split into two phases, move and fire, with all players' actions happening simultaneously. To move, the players all secretly place a token on their helm computer, selecting what movement they wish to do. They then all reveal their choice and move their ships accordingly. If any ships are in range, they may shoot each other, and if any of them end up on the same square, there are rules for ramming. Shooting is simple. Each ship has two weapons, the powerful forward-facing keel gun that works best at long range, and the broadside guns that work best up close. To fire, you take the lid of the game, check how many dice you roll with your gun at your current range, and then roll them in the lid, dropping them from 30 centimeters. Okay, it doesn't have to be exactly 30 centimeters. They're not gonna come to your house and check or anything, but there is a non-zero chance that I will come and check, so, you know, get it right. Any dice that land on a hit are a hit, and any that land on a miss are a miss. Each hit takes off a shield token from the facing that's been hit, and if no shields are left on that side, then you take away a point of damage. If you lose all your damage points, your ship is destroyed, and the last player left is the winner. You might wonder why they even use d6s for this if their numbers aren't used. Well, calm down there, Pilgrim, we are getting to it. If a hit also lands on a 6, you get a critical hit. As well as doing the regular damage, critical hits also get a further d6 roll to get a result on the critical damage chart. The results range from instantly wiping out all shields on the facing side, to preventing movement for a turn, or even causing a fire that can lead to the ship being instantly destroyed. Since all shots are fired simultaneously, that means that it is technically possible for all the players to kill each other on the first turn they can fire. Although, if my very bad maths is correct, the chance of just two ships doing that to each other is around 1 in 150,000. So, I wouldn't hold your breath for that. And despite their appearance, all of the ships share the exact same rules. So despite the game coming with two Imperial Gothic battleships and two Eldar Wraith ships, they play identically. With the only possible differences being how you choose to distribute your shields? Do you spread them evenly, or do you prioritize the angles you think are most likely to receive fire, leaving some parts vulnerable? So that's about it for rules. The ramming works similar to the shooting, except both ships can take damage, and it's technically possible to slam into a planet and live. Not sure how that works in-universe. But it's all pretty simple, and a game can be over very quickly. The fun of Space Fleet comes from trying to outmaneuver each other, trying to guess what your opponent will do as you circle each other, trying to get your weapons to their ideal range to land what you hope will be the killing blow. Although in hindsight, the whole roll your dice in the lid thing seems like a bit of a poor choice. Having an integral part of the game be something that can easily be damaged just by storing the game is probably not the best idea. This copy is in fantastic shape considering it's nearly 30 years old, but just the tiny bit of bowing in the box means every roll you make in it is affected. Although I suppose since everyone has to use the same box, then whatever biases it picks up are given to every player, so at least it's equally unfair for everyone. If we end up playing this more, we'll probably modify a cheap dice tray as a replacement, honestly. So yeah, the box game was short and simple, but it was fun enough for what it was, a conclusion that seems consistent with the contemporary reviews as well. You could expand it by adding more tiles and ships from another box to increase the amount of players, but that was about it on the expansion front. Until you looked through GW's magazine White Dwarf, that is. If you've ever peeked through a White Dwarf issue from this sort of era, then you'll find lots of new rules and expansions for the various games and spin-offs they made. From the previously mentioned combat cards, to Hero Quest, to Space Crusade, they all received additional content in one form or another. And they went pretty hard on Space Fleet for a short time, featuring it in five issues starting in issue 139, radically expanding it into basically a whole new game. The things added include, but are not limited to, all ships having their own unique stats, weaponry, shield values, and even critical damage tables, expanded movement options, new tokens, scenarios, boarding actions where you could take over opposing ships, many, many new ships to play with, and an entirely new faction, the Tyranids, which at the time weren't even particularly fleshed out in 40k proper, so that was fun. They also worked differently to the other factions. They had action cards and their movement phase came after the other players rather than being at the same time. It's 
weird. If any of you have ever played a game of Space Fleet, either with or against Tyranids, then please let us know how that went. We're generally curious, as they seem to be playing a different game to everyone else. Although probably the biggest change comes from the fact that, in a shocking turn of events, you could actually have fleets in Space Fleet. In the base game, you could only have one ship per player, but now all the ships have individual point values, so using all those new minis, you can build a small fleet to fight against others in a manner more similar to GW's more popular titles. Actually, if you happen to have a Space Fleet fleet, then please send us pictures on social media because they're kind of rare and we're just curious to see what you've got. That's right, we are humbly requesting fleet picks. However, in a move that many will be familiar with, the Imperials got the lion's share of the new ships. Hell, the Eldar only got a single new one. Although it should be noted that some of them seem to be repurposed from an older Citadel spaceship line. Those are easy enough to spot though, since, well, they, they look more like actual functional spacecraft, which isn't really very 40k at all. The ships all got a neat reference card, and looking at those new ships they added, here's a few that we thought were pretty fun. The Constellation targeting ship that, despite only having weak, short-ranged guns, meant that any ship close to it could gain its targeting abilities, increasing their range and giving them a free reroll each turn, amongst other things. The Annihilator battleship that had a giant gun turret that got two shots per turn and rotated to change which firing arc it used. It was even possible for it to sustain critical damage and have the gun stuck pointed in one direction. The Tyranid Hive ship, because just look at it. And the Dictator battleship that used its drill and grabby hands to latch onto and board enemy ships. It also has an angry eye painted on it, so you know it means business. There are also a few Imperial ships, like the Emperor Capital ship, that look a lot more like the flying cathedral meets snowplow Imperial ship aesthetic that we see in the later Battlefleet Gothic. And we haven't even mentioned all the art from the articles. Most of it was by Tony Huff, whose art just screams Rogue Trader in all the right ways. Although there were a few great pieces by Rolf Moore depicting Tyranid ships that are also super fun. Some of the 1989 Jez Goodwin Battlefleet Gothic concept art shows up again too. A final thing of note is that these expansions also gave lore to the game that it was lacking. Despite being made to try and lure people into the 40k universe, there wasn't much background information in the base game. All you really got in the manual was... In the 41st millennium, the rule of humanity encompasses almost the entire galaxy. A glittering circle of stars 90,000 light years from rim to rim. And that was about it. The White Dwarf articles gave you information on space travel in the 41st millennium, the Imperial fleets and their ships, navigators and psychers in general, the Mechanicus, there's just pages and pages of it. One little bit we found particularly fascinating was this table showing the time displacement of warp travel. Since time works differently between the warp and real space, there's a discrepancy between how time passes. So for example, to travel 10 light years would take between 14 minutes and an hour in the warp, but in real space it would have taken between 7 hours and 2 days. I would imagine that, to anyone who spends a lot of time on 40k spaceships, figuring out exactly how old you actually are requires a degree in theoretical mathematics. Or at the very least, Imperial birthday cards would have to maintain a certain level of vagueness. And so that was Space Fleet. It didn't last super long, possibly since, although the game was greatly expanded in those five issues of White Dwarf, afterwards there wasn't really anything new. And unless you had those issues of White Dwarf, then you couldn't really play the expanded rules, so you were left with a pretty basic little game. Unless you bought it in France, of course, where you could get a nice compiled version of most of the expanded rules. Not sure why there was never an English language version of that, but I imagine a lot of old GW stuff isn't available in French either, so you know what? That's fair. These days it can be a little expensive to pick up the Space Fleet original box and any of the extra ships released for it, something that also affects its successor, Battlefleet Gothic, although at least with that there's a couple of video game adaptations to sate your lust for grimdark space combat. As with many things like this, Space Fleet remains an interesting artifact, a precursor to later games and a fun little experience if you get a chance to play it. Even in the simple base game, managing to land a full power keel gun shot on your opponent is still incredibly satisfying. Plus, it gives you these teeny tiny ships that you can go with. And who can put a price tag on that? Games Workshop, because they were selling it. True. <laughs>